appreciate for putting together a panel like this on addressing an issue that so often is unaddressed in the Muslim community. It's something that we think like the proverbial ostrich, that if we just bury our heads in the sand, the problem will go away. Now, ostriches, I found out many years ago, don't actually bury their heads in the sand, but this is what is put on an ostrich. And the Muslim community too often acts as if, if we just ignore the issue of racial tension within the Muslim community, that it will just go away. It will not just go away. If you and I want to make any impact on this issue of racism and anti-Muslim racism, that we have to hit the issue head on. And I contend that one of the primary reasons that we are in the space where we are historically and presently is that the Muslims, we have very little knowledge of the history of the racial dynamics, not just within contemporary United States or in the world contemporarily as it relates to different ethnicities and different races within this Ummah. But first and foremost, we have no idea, we have no clue about the history of this wicked thing called racism. As a matter of fact, if I were to take just a brief survey, and so no one gets a grade uh, with what I'm about to ask, but how many of you here know anything about the trans-Saharan slave trade? If you know something about that, let me see your hands. Okay, this is what I expected. Actually, it's a few more uh, than what I expected, but if you poll the majority of Muslims at this convention, if you go into any setting, whether we're talking about a setting where they're predominantly African Americans or African uh, Muslims, no matter what the setting is, very few will say and acknowledge, I don't know anything about that. Yet this particular slave trade that went on from prior to 800 of the Common Era, and many say continues till this day, and there are instances where we can document that yes, something that started as early as the seven and 800 goes on all the way to right now of forcibly transporting Africans across the Saharan Desert, not walking them the way that it was done so many centuries ago, but just actually transporting Africans from the sub-Saharan countries to serve in the homes of the rich, to be servants, to be forced into military service, to, do, to be sexual slaves, to do things like this, it goes on, it started in the 700s and continues to a certain degree all the way up until this day. As a matter of fact, those who keep numbers and document certain kinds of events like this say that over 18 million Africans have been caught up in as victims of this trans-Saharan slave trade. And so it shouldn't come much of a surprise when people like myself make Hajj for the first time in the 1980s, and I go and go to perform Hajj, and so many of my Arab brothers are referring to me as Abd. Abd. I mean, are you leaving something off? I'm here making Hajj. I'm in the shadow of the Kaaba, and you're calling me Abd. And to you, I represent a slave not a slave to a law, but just my categorization, categorization as a human being to you, and my relationship to you is that of a slave. Now this was not just something that happened to me, something that unique was unique to my experience and my wife's experience on this particular hodge, but it it's, has been rooted 
in centuries of a mentality that has been fostered and developed about African people, a people of African descent, that your role in life is that of an ab. You are a slave. And because of a lack of education, even today, I would say that if you were to poll and if you were to ask even some of the more enlightened Arab youth, they could not tell you anything about this trans-Saharan slave trade, which has been so responsible for almost a transference of attitudes towards people of African descent for so many centuries. But I submit that this has been an important piece of history that we as Muslims need to know about. Why? Because many of the lands where these Africans were taken from were the lands of the Muslims. That these were Muslims after the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu who was still being forcibly transported across the Saharan Desert to become slaves in the Middle East, the modern day Middle East. I mean, just let that marinate for a moment and think that those who have embraced Islam, now they are enslaving other Muslims because of this historical relationship that if you want free labor, if you want people who are hardworking and to work, then go across the Sahara and bring them back whether they are Muslim or not. And so there are many other things that I could say in regards to this, but I want to move forward. And I want to move forward to remind myself and remind you about another period of history that has so been so impactful as to how we look at people of color today and attitudes about color today that are infecting this Ummah right as we sit and stand here today. And that's this, this uh, uh, religion that grew out of the Indian subcontinent that we refer to as Hinduism. You know about Hinduism, you know about this, this culture, about this religion, particularly if you're from a background where this has been a predominant way of life for the majority of the people in this part of the world, you know that it has a caste system, that there was an established strict caste system that confined people to certain uh, classes for the rest of their lives. That if you happen to be born in a lower class as a Dalit and untouchable, then your children and their children's children would grow up and they would be consigned to the most uh, lowly jobs that people could do that that was their station because they were born into this class. And then it goes from that, I'm not going to go through all of these classes, but it goes through that up to these Brahmins who were like gods walking on earth. But guess what happened within this system as well? That there was a colorism. There was color added feature that caused it to be very few untouchables or Dalits would you find of a light complexion. That these untouchables were not people who were bright skinned. They were primarily folks of a dark culture and features. And if you take the time to look at the history of the subcontinent, you can see that it wasn't just because of the sun that these people were dark. They were the descendants, direct descendants of Africans who were settled in that part of the world. And somehow their state and their condition becomes one of being uh, frozen in time and frozen in position. Hence we have people like Mahatma Gandhi that we are so Gandhi, 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 even Dr. Martin Luther King, 
took his pilgrimage to India. He wanted to study up close and personal the life of Gandhi. He wanted to see what was going on. So he goes over there and he embraces this idea of nonviolent civil disobedience. And he says it's a wonderful thing and this became the root of the civil rights movement, the modern day civil rights movement in the United States. But some weird people like me have always, since even be being a child, even in my history classes, in my civic classes, I wanted to know the other story. No matter what the history was, I want to know the story behind the story. So I start probing a little bit deeper about who was this guy Gandhi? I mean, he did some wonderful things in India in leading this nation from under British colonialism, but what I found out that in his years in South Africa, he was one of the most racist, bigoted human beings on earth as it related to the black Africans in South Africa. It's documented. It's a documented fact. I'm not just talking about the man because I didn't like him. In his own words, he talks about black Africans, refers to them in this term, the kafir or kafir, which we understand is like synonymous for African Americans to be calling the, called the N-word. In that particular context, it has a mix of this disbeliever, this distasteful kind of person, but it also carries the Western connotation of the N-word. So we have our brothers and sisters who come out of this historical experience who have never addressed that historical phenomenon. So it's been almost something like in their DNA that unknowingly gets passed on. Not that it couldn't be broken. Because even at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, read the history and read how difficult it was for those Arabs to break this psychological, something so deeply embedded in their psychology. So let's fast forward a little bit more and that will be done. Fast forward a little bit more into this formation of this nation. We have the United States. And I don't have time to get into how many Muslims were in the forming and the formative years of this country and the roles that they played even before the formation of this nation called the United States. But you and I know that many of them were coming out of Spain. And many of them were, were of dark complexion. Why? Because many of them who found themselves, themselves in Spain were coming from West Africa. And they were coming there and they were going into Spain and they were forming their own caliphate in Spain and they were helping the Umayyads at the beginning of the formation of these caliphates. So when this trans-Atlantic passage began, many coming over here were Muslim. Many amongst the Spanish. Not necessarily the crazy madmen calling themselves conquistadores who tried to destroy and kill everything within their sight. Not these madmen but others coming in these early days of the colonization of this part of the world came as Muslims. So let's look at it. Listen to your president, 45. 45 has accented an anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, and particularly an anti-Mexican narrative that this country is living out to its fullest. Let's build a wall. Take the money from the public schools. Take the money for lunch programs. Take it from wherever you can grab it, but just get it somewhere 
and let's stop these Mexicans from coming into our country, but read your history. The third largest single acquisition of land in the history of the United States came in 1848, the Treaty of uh, Guadalupe Hidalgo, where about a third of what's now continental United States was through fighting and trickery and everything else was obtained and acquired by the United States government forcibly. And so when this idiot 45 starts talking about get these Mexicans out of here, it's almost like talking about native people in this country. We put them on a reservation. We don't want them here. Well, they were here before you got here, fool. And so same with those people of Mexican descent. They were here, fool, before you got here. So maybe you should go home and let them build a wall and keep you from coming into what was their area and their landmass. I mentioned all of this to try to underscore what is a heartfelt opinion of mine that the racial dynamics and the racial tension that we have in the Muslim community in this country today is a direct result of not acknowledging and not confronting the history of this nation as it relates to color, colorism, and racism. And if you notice, I left out a really huge segment of this history that I don't have time to get into. You may know a little bit more about this little thing called the transatlantic slave trade, where for over three centuries, people of African descent were slaves, chattel, property in this country. If you want to know what made America great, how it got its lead on the world as it relates to resources, look at this transatlantic slave trade. Get free labor for 300 years and see how advanced it would be. But what came along with this was the most vile characterizations of people of African descent that you can find. Some of the most vile things read uh, on Michael Fish or, or, or in archives. New York Times, sorry to crack on your hometown paper, but read the New York Times and see some of the headlines, the way they talked about people of African descent, even in the Bronx Zoo. In 1908, you enslave in a cage in the zoo like an animal Africans and put them on display like they're zoo creatures, zoo animals. This is not some kind of myth. Everything I'm saying is historically documented. So we come to today. And so how do we try to rid ourselves of this big elephant, this beyond an elephant, that's sitting in the middle of the Muslim community in this country? How do we start to chip away at it? Because it can't go away overnight. The Sahaba of the Prophet Muhammad proved to us that no matter how righteous your intent may be, Thank you so much. I'll take the first one. Thank you. That no matter how righteous your intent may be, it takes work. It takes acknowledgement. It takes a, a will to rid ourselves of attitudes that have been so firmly embedded in the psyche of the cultures and the communities that we come from. So number one, educate ourselves about the history of Muslims in this country and your research will reveal some very amazing 
kinds of features and mentalities. Do your research. Research the transatlantic slave trade. And I'm not saying any of these things to say that a person of African descent should be anti-Arab. So no one please go away thinking that this is what I'm saying. I'm just saying that this is a real history that as Muslims, we shouldn't sweep it under the rug and act like it's not there. I'm not making up an attitude with Gandhi and the Hindu faith and the attitude that has been transferred to the United States by so many of our brothers from the subcontinent and the Middle East. And forgive me if I'm, if I'm sounding harsh, but so many of our brothers and sisters who come, Muslims who come from certain parts of the world, unless they're telling me a lie themselves, many of these merchants are telling me, before they come to this country, they're told, find that ghetto community. Go into the ghetto. Set up a shop, whether it's a convenience store or a gas station. Sell cigarettes. Sell par drug paraphernalia. Maybe a crack pipe up under the counter or a crack screen under the counter. Sell uh, malt liquor. Garbage that you can't get out in the suburbs where you live. But come into the inner cities and sell this poison in the name of our not using it they are using it. Well, who are the they? They should be the people that we're trying to give dawah to. You can't give dawah. We can't give dawah if we're looking at people like soulless animals. That all they want to do is just get high. All they want to do is just rape and rob and kill. What kind of dawah can we give when we are approaching people with that mentality? Who, what kind of dawah can we give if we believe what this idiot 45 is promoting? That all of these Mexicans and these Hispanics, all these people, they're just rapists. They're criminals. They're drug dealers. They're drug addicts. So keep them out. So if you and I, if we're not from the Latino community and we internalize this nonsense, what kind of reception can we give to our Latino brothers and sisters when underlying our saying, assalamu alaikum, my brother, my sister, is an attitude that, wow, man, I just found out that you came from a whole group of people that are nothing but criminals, nothing but rapists, and alhamdulillah, Look at you now. You've elevated yourself above your past. You have now become Muslim. So leave all that Latino foolishness behind because you and I know what these people represent. I submit in closing that you and I will never, ever get beyond these racial and ethnic stereotypes that unknowingly we may be harboring. We will never get beyond this until we confront it, until we know where this nonsense is coming from, until we put forth more effort in trying to dispel first with the folks who are, uh, are with our own tribe, with our own ethnicity, with our own racial groups, don't listen. Step one, how do you mitigate it? Don't listen to anyone talk to you about these foolish, racist, bigoted stereotypes. Step one, don't listen to it. It's a sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Do you want molten lead? poured in your ear on yama kiyama because you've listened I like a hot tip so Allah through the Prophet Sallallahu said well Allah is going to give you a hot tip he's going to pour boiling lead in your ear 
for just listening to slander, listening to gossip, malicious talk about other human beings, not to mention your other Muslim brothers and sisters. So let's educate ourselves. Let's know real history. Let's stop listening to foolishness, whether it's coming from 45 in his administration. Cut it off. Don't listen to that nonsense. Just cut it off. You're not missing a thing listening to this fool and the stuff that he's trying to pump and his people are pumping into the American population. As-salamu alaykum.